The following program is intended for the health and wellness of Palm Beach County Fire Rescue firefighters and paramedics. The advice and information contained in this programming may not be appropriate for all individuals. The producers, employees, company, affiliates, or other parties involved in the creation or promotion are not responsible for any injuries or health conditions that may result from the advice represented. This information is not a replacement for medical advice. You should consult a physician before starting any diet or exercise program. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, I'm Tower Cardoso and welcome to Critical Minutes, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue's medical and wellness program for firefighters and paramedics. Nowadays, some children and teens are finding ways to get high from things they can buy right off the corner shelf. Everything from cough medicine to inhalants to even cooking spices. As first responders, it's a good idea to know what the effects of using these substances to get high look like and to know when you might have a potentially flammable situation depending on what they're using. So the mad chemist and the mad doctor join us now to explain how to recognize what you're dealing with. Hello, my name is Ron Holmes. And I'm Lynn Reamer. And in this session, we're going to talk about over-the-counter substances that are legal for teenagers to purchase that they tend to abuse. We also talk about medical consequences and some of the long-term effects as well. DXM stands for dextromethorphan, and it means the abuse of cold medication. And when I say abuse of cold medication, I mean large doses. Kids will drink bottles of Robitussin, Delsum, or Mucinex, or eat entire boxes of Coracidin. So it's high doses of this medication. Now the thing about this is, is it's all dose related. So if you drink a bottle of Robitussin, which is a four hour dose, it's a four hour high. If you drink a 12 hour cough syrup, such as Delsum, the high is 12 hours. Now the names kind of go with what they're abusing. Obviously Robotrypin goes for chugging bottles of Robitussin. Triple C's comes from the Coracidin pills because each pill has three little C's on it. They can also be called Skittles because the different types of Coracidin are different colors and when you have a handful of them, they look like Skittle pills. Dexing is a big one too. And there's just a number of names for it. But it is very, very popular with kids. And the problem with it is Robitussin has, there are different size bottles of Robitussin, so they drink different quantities. You can have a, in a 150 milliliter bottle anywhere from 250 to 400 milligrams of dextromethorphan. The larger bottle that has 250 milliliters of Robitussin has over 670 milligrams of dextromethorphan. And the problem is, is that this is a lot of uh, cough medicine and it overwhelms the body. And because dextromethorphan is in the PCP family, it is considered a dissociative anesthetic. It does cause you to feel good and it does cause hallucinations. Um, the 600 milligrams or higher can alter your consciousness, cause out of body experiences, very similar to PCP. Um, it can speed up um, some of your sensory perception and it can cause temporary psychosis. Again, you're consuming large amounts of cough medicine that the body doesn't really like in large amounts. Now, not only do you get dextromethorphan in there, depending on what you drink, you could get high doses of pseudoephedrine, chlortrimeton, 
guaifenesin, and of course Tylenol. And those high doses can overwhelm the brain and cause a lot of problems. And some of them we just don't know about for long-term uh, issues. But a lot of times at these parties, kids are very, very active. You know, they're running around, they're dancing, they're very active. So you can see a lot of issues with hyperthermia where their body temperature gets very high. It may start as hot flashes, um, but then it can just cause the core body temperature to rise and cause the brain to become overheated and that can be very dangerous. You see a lot of impairment in their judgment and mental functioning as well. They have a loss of coordination. Sometimes they look like they're drunk and they slur their speech. Uh, they, ha they are confused. They lose their coordination. They can get numbness in fingers and toes. Uh, they can have increased heart rate and blood pressure because all these chemicals are reacting differently on the body. And that also causes a lot of nausea and vomiting along as with seizures and brain damage because we're talking about large doses of these chemicals in combination in the body that the body's just not used to. The big thing about it is they have a huge sensitivity to light. And these kids will sit in a classroom and they will always have their sunglasses on. They'll refuse to take them off. Even at night, they'll be wearing their sunglasses. So that is a huge key. Now, another legal compound out there is nutmeg. And nutmeg has a very active compound in it that causes hallucinations and uh, causes some altered perception. But the thing about it is, is nutmeg is an over-the-counter substance that anybody can go out and access very easily. Now, in large doses, this active ingredient does cause hallucinations. I'm sure if you wanted to, you could snort it, smoke it, ingest it, uh, vaporize it, do all different types of things, but mostly they do make a tea out of it and just flat out drink it. Uh, and in one to four hours, you can start having some uh, hallucinations, auditory and sensory. Uh, you can also have an increase in your heart rate, uh, maybe some nerve problems, v things will vary. And then when you look at the hallucinations, they can last for a couple days, but it's kind of like flashbacks, things kind of come and go. So you have a lot of varying effects with nutmeg, but the bottom line is, is this is legal and anyone can go out and access it. Now, as far as inhalants, they are a huge problem out there, as you all know. And there have been about three-fourths of a million new users, 12 and older, just in 2010. There are about 69% of those users were under the age of 18. Well, there's a Monitoring the Future study that they did in 2011 that gives a breakdown on the ages that are using this. And this tends to be popular with kids from about middle school up to high school. However, people that are older in their young, uh, early 20s in college can use it as well. So kids can easily get arrested for doing this, even though they think they can't, because it's legal stuff that they're inhaling and they think there's no problem with it. Now, there are multiple types of inhalants that people use. There are volatile liquids like gasoline, acetone, um, things like that. You have your aerosols, which are spray-based, so starting fluid, paint. Um, you have different gases, such as nitrous oxide, which we'll talk about. And then you have the nitrates. And all of these will be covered um, as we talk about the inhalants. Now, the thing about inhalants is, is this the inhalation of anything, and I mean anything, that has an odor? Uh, most of these are legal. Some of, uh, some of the stores now have decided that you need to be 18 and produ produce an ID to actually purchase some of this stuff. Now in the picture here you see Ready Whip and Ready Whip has nitrous oxide in it and this is very very popular with kids. Now nitrous oxide as the doc is going to talk about is a substance that you all know is given when people have dental work. But all these other ones can be used easily. Gasoline, um, dust off and again the name comes from the way that they're using it. Well they can use this anyway usually they are snorting them or huffing them or ingesting it through their lungs or up their nose they get it into their lungs some way. Um, bagging uh, is they put the substance in a bag huffing is they have to soak a rag uh, in liquid and then put the liquid in a bag shake it and kind of huff it from there they can huff things straight into their mouth, up their nose, and they can also fill balloons or other apparatuses uh, to inhale the stuff as well. I've talked to kids who have just sprayed it right up their nose and it freeze dries all that tissue up there and they get major nosebleeds, which can cause damage for multiple days. The thing about it is because it's cold, a lot of kids get rid of the coldness 
and the fact that they now have put a bitterant in it to make it taste nasty, we'll take a shirt or a jacket, fold it over, and spray it right through clothing, which comes, cuts down some of the coldness. Um, so this air duster is very, very dangerous. And when kids inhale air duster or anything that's cold, they can also have burns. You'll see burns on their lip, on their tongue. Sometimes you see spray burns across their face because the first time they use the inhalant, they're okay but then they start getting a little loopy, they turn the can, they spray it, and so you can have spray burns on the face as well. Now, inhaling cold things, as you know, is very, very dangerous. Another cold substance that kids will inhale is Freon, and they go straight out to the air conditioner units that have a little release valve on them, and they'll release it. Sometimes they put a straw in their mouth, put their straw in the little release valve, and suck in all that cold vapor, or sometimes they throw a jacket or a blanket over them, release the valve, that blanket or jacket kind of focuses the gases to come up to their face, and they just inhale it all in. This stuff is very, very dangerous. Kids have died from inhaling cold things because it freezes their brainstem. Now, also, kids will do bagging, and that's where you uh, spray stuff in a bag or you pour gasoline in a bag without a rag, shake it up, and you put it over your nose and mouth, and you breathe it all in. And so, again, the names just come from the way that they're using it. Your lungs fill with these nasty chemicals. These chemicals absorb through the lungs into our bloodstream. The first place blood goes from our lungs is to our heart, and the first place blood pumps from the heart is up to the head. Well, sometimes, as we all know, people die from inhalants, and that's because they have a large dose of this already in their bloodstream, in their lungs. They're blacked out. The only thing going up to their head is these nasty chemicals, and their autonomic nervous system will shut off. So there's a lot of issues, as you all know, with inhalants, and the picture here is just a device that kids will use to do inhalants. Now, they jerry-rig all kinds of things. They'll take cans, they take water bottles, stick a little uh, tube in them, and then they spray the stuff in the top and huff it out the little tube. They can put modeling glue in there. We've been, uh, I've been called out before where kids will stick stinky magic markers in there. You put just about anything in there. It's just a jerry-rig device, a way to uh, huff uh, inhalants. Now, when people use inhalants, because all those chemicals are going to the brain, one other problem with those inhalants and those chemicals is they dissolve fat. And they, so they start to dissolve the fatty tissue in the brain. And that can create a whole lot of problems, as you can imagine. So when you look at the signs and symptoms of people that use inhalants, one of the big indicators is the odor. They will have the odor on them. They get it on their shirt. They have it sprayed in their hair. You will see residue around the nose and the mouth. And so the odor of inhalants is a huge clue. But because they're getting it on their nose and the mouth, sensitive part of our skin, you can also see rashes and stuff there as well. Because it is damaging the brain, you know, you get a lot of slurred speech. They complain of massive headaches. They have this kind of dazed appearance to them. Uh, and they have lack of muscle control. Now, because the liver and the kidneys and our heart pump and or filter blood, you can see a lot of issues with that as well. And our lungs take in all those uh, chemicals, and so they get damaged as well. So a lot of issues with inhalants, but um, you can see a change quite quickly from people that are using inhalants. Now here's a story that's true that happened here in Colorado at one of our local high schools. One, uh, there were three girls one day that decided they were going to huff air freshener in a car. And they got in the car, they closed the doors, they rolled the windows up nice and tight, and they start huffing all this air freshener. Well, one of the girls in her brilliance decided that she would light her cigarette, and the entire car exploded. It blew out all the windows, blew off the doors, and by the time law enforcement and fire got there, they thought just from the damage to the car alone, they might be picking up body parts everywhere. Well, the girls were very fortunate. They did survive in one piece. However, they were severely burned. So the thing about inhalants is, is these are also extremely fine particulates. And when you mix them with the right concentration of oxygen in air and you add a little flame source to it, you can have major explosions. So a lot of issues with these inhalants, um, and you do see a lot of these inhalants in, in meth labs as well, which made people concerned because of the possibility for explosion. Lynn has told you about inhalants and how they're used. How do they work? Well, they all share a similar pathway. These are taken in through the mouth into the lungs and absorbed in the lungs into the bloodstream. 
In the bloodstream, these substances, these chemicals, move to all the organs, including the brain, and they depress the brain. They depress the central nervous system very much the way that alcohol uh, suppresses the nervous system. The effects only last a short time, so users will take another hit to get that same effect. They're after the euphoric effect, but each time they take a hit, it causes a little bit more brain damage, a little bit more brain irritation. So repeated inhalations are needed to, to maintain uh, or sustain a high. Now, what are the consequences of that? Remember, this is going to the brain. So over time, there's loss of consciousness. There's loss of control. You can't use your muscles in the same way that you ordinarily would. And ultimately, if you overuse, you're going to suffocate. Just as Lynn said, these substances displace oxygen from your blood. Now, all of the inhalants contain substances that enter our lungs and enter our bloodstreams. Now, these sub substances are broken down. Some are called volatile hydrocarbons, meaning they're in the liquid form, but when you put them into a bag on a rag, and you've all smelled paint odor, they volatilize, and it is that gas that is dangerous. Now, there are others, like nitrous oxide, that come in a form delivered to the person as a, a gas. Both of these forms of hydrocarbons and nitrous oxide are dangerous. Hydrocarbons have two primary effects. They work on the brain, as I've told you about, and they affect a neurotransmitter. Now, in our brain, there are chemicals that help the brain to, to function, to transfer a signal from one brain cell to another. Some of these neurotransmitters excite us, turn us on, and others calm us down. The calming down one is called GABA, G-A-B-A. -A. And these inhalants in the brain act just like GABA, slows us down, inhibits our reflexes, inhibits motor control, inhibits speech. Now, these substances also have an effect on our heart. They can cause arrhythmias with a rapid heart rate or an irregular heart rate. Uh, when that happens, the heart requires more oxygen. Well, if you're taking in an inhalant, you're not having as much, as much oxygen in the blood, and now there's extra demands on your heart, and you may have uh, chest pain. You can, these things can cause spasm or narrowing uh, of the coronary arteries. If you happen to be 20 years old and already have some fat narrowing your arteries, you're a setup uh, for a heart attack because these things also affect the way our blood coagulates. It's called platelet aggregation, and if platelets stick together, they form a clot or a thrombus, and if that's in a coronary heart vessel, you're in trouble. The biggest thing, and probably the most common problem, though, for adolescents is aspiration uh, pneumonia, a chemical pneumonia that occurs uh, as a result of taking in an inhalant, and particularly a hydrocarbon. Now, hydrocarbons, they enter the lung, they go into the bloodstream, they cause pneumonia in the lung, they can cause heart failure for reasons I just pointed out. They can go to the livers and kidneys and cause damage there. And as Lynn said earlier, people who take these and are high, they may have vomiting. If they have lost motor control and they're getting sleepy, they vomit, aspirate, and death occurs. Adolescents, recall, have a developing brain. That brain is developing till about age 25. Now, if you take in, if you're an adolescent and you take in a volatile hydrocarbon or some other substance, but let's focus on volatile hydrocarbons, those are going to go to the brain. What are they going to do? They're chemicals. They're chemicals that Lynn already pointed out dissolve fat. If you are 18, let's say you're 18, you've been using inhalants for a couple years, you're getting high every weekend, brain damage will occur. Look at these CT images of the brain. Let's say, go back to our 18-year-old who's been using inhalants for a couple years. Image A is a normal brain, and you can see a fairly regular contour and creases in the brain that are normal. Image B 
is that of a child. Again, it could be an 18-year-old. And look at the brain has shrunk in size. Look at the space between the skull and the brain. Look at this area is called the ventricles. This is the center of the brain. These areas contain fluid. They're much larger. Why are they larger? Because the brain has shrunk in size. Now, for a developing brain, to go through this means permanent brain damage. Permanent brain damage, irreversible damage. It can result in that child having motor problems and learning problems, behavior problems for the rest of their lives. And nitrous oxide is popular among uh, teenagers. Uh, if you consider Demi Moore as a teenager, uh, she was recently seen uh, in her emergency room after uh, allegedly using nitrous oxide, uh, snorting Adderall, uh, and smoking uh, synthetic marijuana. Now, nitrous oxide is popular because it's easy to obtain. Uh, nitrous oxide is a propellant uh, used in uh, whipping cream. Uh, Ready Whip is one of the brands. If someone inhales nitrous oxide, they get a high. It's called laughing gas. They get a high, you're out of control, you really feel good, you feel uh, euphoric, but there are problems with it too. As Lynn mentioned, it's an asphyxiant, displaces oxygen, so you can get uh, major uh, uh, problems with asphyxiation, loss of motor control, and vomiting. Before that happens, with smaller doses, you might have uh, muscle contractions that appear like you're having a seizure. There might be some twitching of your arms and hands, but it's not a seizure activity. SAMHSA, a federal organization that reports uh, on drug abuse, has noted that the use of nitrous oxide is very common and most common in middle school kids. There are other ways to use a nitrous oxide uh, besides the Ready Whip uh, can. Adolescents can go out and purchase a container of nitrous oxide the nitrous oxide is put into this whippet. It's screwed into the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece opens the bottle. Nitrous oxide fills the balloon, and then the adolescent or child will inhale through that mouthpiece and get in all the nitrous oxide they want to get high. There's other ways to get high. Now, there are these other uh, substances out there that are legal that kids get into, and many of them are brownies. Now, the first brownies to appear on scene were called lazy cakes. And the rumor came out, you first saw them about four years ago, that they had synthetic spice in them, synthetic pot, that designer cannabinoid. Well, they never have had synthetic pot in them. They have high doses of melatonin. And you should recognize the word melatonin because melatonin is a hormone that is secreted in our brain to help regulate our sleep cycle. Melatonin also is easily sold as an over-the-counter dietary supplement to help people that have problems going to sleep. Well, when we talk about melatonin in these brownies, I'm talking about a high dose of melatonin, anywhere from 200 to 400 milligrams of melatonin. Well, the thing about high doses of melatonin is it mimics the effects of marijuana. So quickly, the rumor became marijuana brownies. Then all of a sudden you saw new ones pop up, like Mary J's, which leads us to believe that marijuana's in there. But marijuana's not in there, it's a high dose of melatonin. Well, you can also get high doses of melatonin in all these drinks now. The most popular is Bob Marley's. But you will see a number of them out on the market and they put them right next to the energy drinks for kids. And kids know about them. They have, again, very high doses of melatonin, hundreds of milligrams, where usually if you take melatonin to help you sleep, it's a half a milligram, maybe a milligram or two maximum, but we're talking hundreds of milligrams in these over-the-counter substances. Well, if you do the research about these melatonin drinks, there are actually websites that tell you which one goes best with what type of alcohol. Mix this one with rum because it tastes better, and oh, this one's better with vodka. That is a huge problem because melatonin makes us sleepy. Alcohol makes us sleepy. This combination can be very dangerous, but unfortunately, there's all this information out all over the website um, marketing this stuff. Now, there are some serious effects when people consume way too much melatonin, and you can see them here. And they present in ERs all the time with these types of things. 
They can be a little dizzy, have some headaches. Um, they're confused. They can hallucinate a little bit. Obviously, they're going to have abdominal discomfort, especially if they're drinking uh, large quantities of these drinks or eating a number of brownies. They can have mood and mental changes as well because, again, high doses is not good for us uh, of melatonin or, or many things. You see a lowering of their body temperature. You can decrease their libido. And there's a very interesting effect that happens to men that consume this, and the medical community calls it man boobs. And we have talked to many doctors, and they've told us that if they have someone showing up in an ER, kind of confused, complaining of headaches, not making a lot of sense, obviously they treat everybody, but they will lay you on a table and they rip everybody's shirt off. Well, if they notice a male has man boobs, then they start a conversation with them and start asking them, have you been consuming these drinks that have high doses of melatonin? Have you been eating these brownies? And they say it's a very easy fix. Because what happens when you consume large amounts of melatonin is it can't be broken down during our regular pathway. It's got to shoot over into our fat pathway to be broken down. And when melatonin goes through our fat pathway, our body creates it into estrogen and estradiol, which in high doses creates man boobs in men. So this will be seen as well in men also. Uh, there have been reports of men having a de decreased sperm count because of it as well. But again, this stuff is legal, accessible out there. Uh, a lot of uh, stores buy it. Some parts of the country you can buy these brownies and drinks even at Walgreens and CVS pharmacies. pharmacies. So the bottom line is it's illegal. It's another over-the-counter substance that people abuse to get altered effects from it. Now the bottom line is this, anytime you're dealing with people, all you need to do is pay attention to your senses. Pay attention to what you see. Are you seeing the burns on their lip or the spray burns? Uh, you know, are they a little agitated? Uh, are they dazed and confused? You know, are they looking right through you when you look at them? Pay attention to what they smell like or what you smell because you will smell the odor, especially of these inhalants. Uh, you can smell other drugs as well. And because so much makes us, so many things make us vomit, the odor of vomit is important as well. But we also will try to hide all these. So you'll have an excess of perfume or aftershave and people will dry, smear uh, dryer sheets on themselves to uh, get rid of odor as well. And lastly, pay attention to what you hear. You know, are they slurring their words? Are they making any sense at all? Are you talking to them about one thing and they're off on a tangent uh, about something else? Uh, are they speaking fast? Are they speaking real slow, slurring their words? All of these things are indicators that somebody could be under the influence of something. Now, Urban Dictionary is a wonderful app that you can get on your smartphones. It comes in both, both the Droid and the Apple type of app. And this is very valuable because if you type terminology in there that you hear, like huffing, and you're not sure what it means, type it into Urban Dictionary, and if it's drug-related, it comes up in the top three, it's going to tell you what drug, if it's laced with anything, the verbiage and how it's used in sentences. So it's a really nice app to help figure out terminology that you may not understand uh, what people are talking about. So uh, these are all good things to remember when you're dealing with people. We hope this has been an informative session. If you would like more information, please contact us either by telephone or uh, email, and we'll respond and give you uh, the information that you need. Thank you. That's it for today's program. I'm Tara Cardoso. Take care.